Parenthood is a beautiful act of nature that no doubt involves sacrifice. Some do that by spending their days tirelessly hunting for food to feed their young. Some work an extra job or leave their job to provide for their kids. And some let their children eat them alive. Matrophagy is the process of offspring consuming their parents. And there's good evidence to suggest that this behavior evolved because it's a winning strategy. It's been successful enough to adapt in multiple species after all, despite being a rare and pretty extreme trait. So, why? What would drive an animal to engage in this behavior, and why would it ever be better than the parents feeding them in some other way? Well, that's what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. Fair warning, there will be a lot of spiders in this one. If you hate them, or just this subject matter in general, feel free to click off. But if you don't, here's a happy spider dancing. Look at him go! Oh, and let's talk about the evolutionary benefit of eating your parents. In the animal kingdom, we see parents eat their kids all the time. Like, it's pretty common when you have a lot of babies to make a small snack of them since it doesn't really hurt your reproductive fitness that much. But what would drive a baby to eat their mother? And yes, it only happens to mothers, probably because they are the primary or only caregiver in most animals. This is why it's called matrophagy. Matri for mother and phagy meaning to feed on. It's looked at in the literature as an extreme form of parental care. And the best way to learn about it is with examples, so let's talk about some spiders. In the black lace weaver, a day after hatching, offspring eat trophic eggs, which are eggs laid specifically for the sake of nutrition and not reproduction. Days later, the mother begins communicating with her offspring by making web vibrations, drumming, and jumping, which signals to the babies when and where they can consume her. That's right, it's actually the mother communicating with her babies in spiders web language saying hey kids time for dinner which is me come come eat me I'm I'm dinner so they migrate towards her and start jumping onto her back. But then the mother starts jumping and shaking frantically, trying to keep her offspring off of her as they continue to relentlessly leap onto her back. The reason she does this is because she's waiting for all the offspring to get on, in which point she is ready and presses her body onto the babies, which allows them to begin making a meal of their mom by sucking out her insides. They do this by injecting a poison into her body, melting her innards, and giving her a quick death as they consume her. Not all mothers are allowed quick and painless deaths though. The crab spider, not to be confused with the spider crab, or the spider crab, yeah, there are a lot of different spider crabs, also generates trophic eggs. Except the eggs are too large for the mother to lay in this species, and so they're liquefied into hemolymph, which is basically the invertebrate equivalent of blood, that the babies drink out of her leg joints. Uh, they don't even pop the boba straw into her, they just slurp her legs on sight, causing the mom to gradually shrink until she slowly becomes immobile and dies. The desert spider, which is my favorite, after hatching spiderlings, regurgitates her own bodily fluids for them to eat and grow. But once the babies get about one to two weeks old, the spiderlings want more of these delicious body fluids, and so they just start eating her alive, and there's nothing she can do about it. How cool is that? So, despite having a similar base behavior in matrophagy, it can clearly be expressed in so many different ways, even just amongst spiders. What's even more interesting, though, is that in the spiders I just talked about, the offspring almost exclusively eat their biological mother, and generally refrain from eating other females in the population, which kind of demonstrates how this behavior is an evolved think. It's so specific and clearly has some type of signaling happening back and forth between the mother and the offspring. I mean, the spiderlings usually don't eat their mothers right away. They spend a few days eating other food sources before engaging in matrophagy. Now, we don't fully know what's going on, and each species could be wildly different, but there is some kind of fine-tuned mechanism to allow for this behavior to occur when it needs to. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea that matrophagy is an evolved thing, but what actually makes matrophagy adaptive, like what is the benefit that it provides? Well, mainly, and this sounds kind of obvious, but it provides nutrition for the babies. This is super vital because it can give them the ability to live and grow and make it farther in their lives. When measuring the differences between spiderlings that got to feed on their mother versus not in the yellow sack spider, researchers found that matrophagous ones had a number of advantages. Their body mass and epistathosoma 
I, I don't know how to say that, but it's basically their big butts that spiders have, uh, increase significantly. It also advances molting time, which is the process of growing a larger exoskeleton and ditching the old one by shedding. Faster molting means growing at a faster rate, which can mean the difference between life or death, especially for a small invertebrate. Additionally, matrophagous spiderlings have demonstrated greater survival rates, they hunt larger prey and eat them more completely, and they have lower rates of cannibalism amongst their siblings. It seems in matrophagous phages animals, this behavior severely improves fitness when compared to individuals who did not get to feed on their mother. And then from there, it's just pure natural selection. The spiders that eat their mothers do better and end up being able to mate and lay eggs, which hatches spiderlings that inherited the behaviors that made their mommy successful, thereby inheriting the eating of their mother and continuing the cycle. You see, evolution has no incentive to keep you alive, just your genetic properties. Because this trait, which involves the death of a parent, lets the parent's lineage continue on, thus allowing the trait to propagate regardless of killing one of its bearers. This is also why a lot of animals will die in the process of getting to reproduce in general. Octopus die tending to their eggs. Mayflies, famous for their one-day life cycle, will mate in the air and then land and just die. Also, before modern healthcare, a shocking number of mothers died from natural childbirth, because childbirth is a dangerous process. I myself am a c-section baby. I'm pretty sure. But for most of history, they didn't really scoff when there was a death of a parent in order to give the birth of a child. That doesn't mean that it's morally right to ever prioritize a baby over a mother. If you want to have that conversation though, you guys can do that without me, please. But I digress. Basically, offspring success at the cost of a parent's life can be favorable in terms of fitness, or it can at the very least not be the end of the world, which is why we see it happen a lot in nature. So while being eaten alive isn't very good for being able to reproduce anymore, you're banking that your kids will carry on and keep your lineage alive, which might just be good enough to do so. I mean, it's a much better shot than failing to find food for your kids in another way. It is harsh out here in nature. We gotta do what we gotta do to make ends meet. Let's look at how matrophagy in the hump earwig demonstrates this. These disgusting creatures seem to regularly reproduce in colder temperatures. Why? Because it decreases the chance of predators being out and about, helping the earwig nymphs have enough time to survive and grow up. That said, because it's cold, there aren't many nutrients available for the offspring to survive and grow up, which is why if they eat their mom, the kids can have a sufficient startup loan to keep them alive long enough so that they can metamorphose into an adult. So yeah, matrophagy is extreme but sensible. It allows babies a useful nutrition source to kickstart their early careers. But so far, I've only talked about animals that are obligately... obligingly? Obligate... uh... Ob obligatorily... obligatorily matrophagous. Matrophagous. Fuck. When an animal is obligate something, it means that they have to do it. So obligate matrophagy would be where animals always eat their mothers. Non-obligate matrophagy would be animals that can eat their mothers and sometimes do, but only under the right conditions. I haven't talked about those. The funnel web spider is a really cool species that has extended maternal care. The mother wears her egg sac like a knapsack and incubates them for a month, protecting her babies from predators or parasites. And this is a really efficient strategy because it lets the mother stay stay mobile while taking care of her kids, letting her find food for both of them without having to worry. But what if it turns out to be a low nutrient environment where food is scarce? Well, then she lays herself down and dies, letting her kids eat her. Pseudoscorpions, these funny little arachnids that wave their hands around, will engage in matrophagy during times of food scarcity as well. The mothers hatch their offspring, then leave their nest and just wait there to be consumed. The babies follow the mother out and feed through her leg joints, similar to the crab spider. Both of these examples are consistent with our earlier understanding of matrophagy as a benefit. It provides as a much needed food source, especially when food isn't readily available. And this might help us model how less extreme parenting strategies change based on the environment as well. In theory, with less food available, parents should sacrifice for their children, much like non-obligate matrophages, just with their own food and not bodies, eating less in order to feed their children more. And this is something that we actually do see, at least based on what I've observed in humans and other mammals. I mean, all parents sacrifice to a certain degree, lowering their individual 
individual resource potential and potentially lifespan for the sake of their offspring to carry on. This is called parental investment, and it's a complex field of evolutionary biology because it involves a lot of dynamics about how parents should split their resources amongst their kids and to themselves. At the same time, each individual kid wants to favor themselves over their siblings, and so it actually creates a lot of friction. Uh, this is called parent-offspring conflict, and I will gladly make a more expanded video about it if you guys are interested, but honestly, theories of parental investment don't apply the best when it comes to matrophagy, because the mother simply dies and can't really bias her resources towards any kid in particular. And so, because we don't know too much about the theory, I just wanted to end this video with behaviors that are similar to matrophagy, just to get us thinking. Let's start with humans. Yeah, uh, when the female human is pregnant in a weird way, the fetus is kind of eating her. Yes, the mom is technically feeding her internally, but it's not a conscious thing where she goes and gets food and physically feeds it to her. It's really automatic. And there are real cases where the fetus will take more than the mother is willing to give. And so some people would rather frame it as the child consuming the mother rather than the mother feeding the child. This has raised deeper questions like, can fetuses be considered parasites? Okay, and final example are Sicilians. Not the ones from Italy, but the worm-like amphibians that live in soil or water. Uh, they will let their children eat them, but won't actually die in the process. See, the babies will bite chunks out of the mother's skin, which she will regrow and sometimes even grow extra layers of skin for, uh, allowing the children to eat freely. This is called skin feeding, and it is kind of gross. Is it evolutionarily comparable to true matrophagy? I mean, who knows? This stuff is all very complicated, and no one has really grasped it yet but I don't see why we couldn't consider it a soft form of matrophagy that just doesn't involve death. Anyways, yeah, um, matrophagy is actually really understudied, because no one wants to study it. Who would have thought? But it's obviously a very cool behavior that might actually help us understand the greater evolutionary dynamics of parental investment and when death is worth it. This can tell us a lot about inclusive fitness, which is also a massive field that I won't get into in this video. But yeah, um, if you don't want to get devoured by hundreds of your babies, then maybe Make sure to subscribe. It turns out my subscribers have a 0% likelihood of that happening. I'm pretty sure. And to my regular viewers, sorry I've been gone for a while. I'll try to be more consistent. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.